Hello, sixth grade students, and welcome to the final lesson this week with our language arts subject. Go ahead and please take out your language arts notebooks, turn to a clean sheet, name today's date. Let's go ahead and review our objective today. I can explain how Hinton develops different characters' perspectives and analyze how and why characters' perspectives change in response to plot events. Notice this is the same objective we are still delving into with going over Chapter 8 of The Outsiders. So for today's assignment, you're going to read Chapter 8 of The Outsiders. I want you to answer the following questions in a Google Doc in four to five sentences, complete sentences, with capital letters and periods. Number one, Pony and Cherry have an argument, but when they say goodbye, they are on good terms. What causes this change in mood? Number two, what internal conflict could Johnny be having? And number three, if Derry didn't have soda and Pony, why would he be a sock? So join me now as we continue reading The Outsiders with chapter 8. The nurses wouldn't let us see Johnny. He was in critical condition, no visitors. But Two-Bit wouldn't take no for an answer. That was his buddy in there, and he aimed to see him. We begged and pleaded, but we were getting nowhere until the doctor found out what was going on. Let, it, let them go in, he said to the nurses. He had been asking for them. It couldn't hurt now. Two-Bit didn't notice the expression in his voice. It's true, I thought numbly. He, was, he is dying. We went in practically on tiptoe because the quietness on the hospital scared us. Johnny was lying still with his eyes closed, but when, he, when Two Bits said, Hey, Johnny kid, he opened up and looked at us, trying to grin. Hey, y'all. The nurse, who was pulling the shades open, smiled and said, So we can talk after all. Two Bit looked around. They treating you okay, kid? Don't, Johnny gasped. Don't let them put enough grease on my hair. Um, don't talk, Two Bits said, pulling up the chair. Just listen. We'll bring you some hair grease next time. We're having the big rumble tonight. Johnny's huge eyes widened a little. He didn't say anything. It's too bad you and Dally can't be in it. It's the first big rumble we've had, not counting the time we, we whipped Shepard's outfit. He came by, Johnny said. Tim Shepard? Johnny nodded. Came to see Dally. Tim and Dallas had always been buddies. Did you know um, you got your name in the paper for being a hero? Johnny almost grinned and, he's, and he nodded. Tough enough, he managed. And by the way, his eyes were glowing. I figured Southern, Southern Gentleman had noting on Johnny Cade. I could see that even a few words were tiring him out. He was as pale as the pillow and looked awful. Tupid pretended not to notice. You want anything besides hair grease, kid? Johnny barely nodded. The book. He looked at me. Can you get another one? Tupid looked at me. I hadn't told him about Gone with the Wind. He wants a copy of Gone with the Wind so I can read it to him, I explained. You want to run down to the drugstore and get one? Okay, Tubit said cheerfully. Don't y'all run off. I sat down in Tubit's chair and tried to think of something to say. Dally's going to be okay, I said finally. And Derry and me, we're okay now. I knew Johnny understood what I meant. We had always been close buddies, and those lonely days in the church strengthened our friendship. We tried to smile again, and then suddenly went white and closed his eyes tight. Johnny, I said, are you okay? He nodded, kept his eyes closed. Yeah, it just hurts sometimes. It usually don't. I can't feel anything below the middle of my back. He's laying pretty heavily for a moment. I'm pretty bad off, ain't I, Pony? You'll be okay, I said with fake cheerfulness. You gotta be. We couldn't get along without you. The truth of the last statement hit me. We couldn't get along without him. We needed Johnny as much as he needed the gang, and for some the same reason. I won't be able to walk again, Johnny stared, started, then faltered. Not even on crutches. Busted my back. You'll be okay, I repeated firmly. Don't start crying, I commanded myself. Don't start crying. You'll scare Johnny. You want to know something, pony boy? I'm scared stiff. I used to talk about killing myself. He drew a quivering breath. I, I don't know. I don't want to die now. It ain't long enough. Sixteen years ain't long enough. I wouldn't mind it so much if there weren't so much stiff stuff I, I ain't done yet. So many things I ain't seen. It's not fair. You know what? That time when we were in Win Dixonville... And it was the only time I'd ever been away from the neighborhood. You ain't gonna die, I said, trying to hold my voice down. We don't get juiced up because the doc won't let us... And don't get juiced up because the doc won't let us see you no more if we, you, you do. Sixteen years in the streets and you can't... You can, and you can learn a lot. But all, all the wrong things. Not the things you want to learn. Sixteen years in the streets and you see a lot. But all the wrong sights. Not the sights you want to see. Johnny closed his eyes and rested quietly for a minute. Years of living on the east side teaches you how to shut off your emotions. 
If you didn't, you would explode. You'll learn to cool it. A nurse appeared in the doorway. Johnny, she said quietly, your mother's here to see you. Johnny opened his eyes. At first, they were wide with surprise, and then they darkened. I don't want to see her, he said firmly. She's your mother. I said I don't want to see her, his voice was rising. She'll probably come to tell me about all the trouble I'm causing her and how, how glad her and the old man will be when I'm dead. Well, tell her to leave me alone for once, his voice broke. For once, just leave me alone. He was struggling to sit up, but he suddenly gasped, went whiter than the pillowcase, and passed out cold. The nurse hurried me out the door. I was afraid of something like this. He, if he saw anyone, I ran into Tubit who was coming in. You can't see him now, the nurse said, said so Tubit handed her the book. Make sure he can see it when it comes around. She took it and closed the door behind her. Tubit stood and looked at the door the long time. I wish it was any one of us except Johnny, he said, and his voice was serious for once. We could get along without anyone but Johnny. Turning abruptly, he said, let's go see Dallas. As we walked out the hall, we saw Johnny's mother. I knew her. She was a little woman, with straight black hair and big black eyes like Johnny. But that was as far as, as the resemblance went. Johnny Cake's eyes were fearful and sensitive. Hers were cheap and hard. As we passed her, she was saying, But I have a right to see him. He's my son! After all the trouble his father and I've gone to raise him, this is our reward? He'd rather, he'd rather see those no-count hoodlums than his own folks? She saw us and gave such a look of hatred that I almost backed up. It was, our, it was your fault, always running around in the middle of the night, getting jailed, and, and heaven knows what else. I thought she was going to cuss us out. I really did. Two-Bit's eyes got narrowed, and I was afraid he was, going to start, he was going to start something. I don't like to hear women get sworn at, even if they deserve it. No wonder he hates your guts, Two-Bit snapped, and he was going to tell her off real good, but I shoved him along. I felt sick. No wonder Johnny didn't want to see her. No wonder he stayed overnight at Two Bits or our house and slept in a vacant lot in good weather. I remembered my mother, beautiful and golden like soda and wise and firm like dairy. Oh, Lordy! There was a catch in Two Bits' voice and he was close to tears than I'd ever seen him. He, lives, he lived with that? We hurried to the elevator and got to the next floor. I hoped the nurse would have enough sense not to let Johnny's mother to see him. It would kill him. Dally was arguing with one of the nurses when we came in. He grinned at me. Man, I'm glad to see you. These hospital people won't let me smoke, and I want out. We sat up, grinning at each other. Dally was his usual mean, ornery self. He was okay. Shepard came by to see me a while ago. That's what Johnny said. What do you want? Said he saw my picture in the paper, and he couldn't believe it didn't, ha didn't have wanted dead or alive underneath it. He mostly came to rub it in, rub it in about the rumble. Man, I hate not being at that. Only last week, Tim Shepard had cracked three of Dally's ribs, but Dally and Tim Shepard had always been buddies. No matter how they fought, they were two of a kind, and they knew it. Dally was grinning at me. Kid, you scared the devil out of me the other day. I ought to kill you. Me, I said, puzzled. Why? When you jumped out of that church, I mean to hit you so hard enough to knock you down and put the fire out. But when you dropped like a ton of lead, I thought I ain't too high and broke your neck. He thought for a minute. I'm glad I didn't, though. I'll bet, I said with a grin. I never, liked, I never liked Dally, but then for the first time, I felt like he was my buddy. And all because he was glad he hadn't killed me. He looked out the window. Ah, oh, he sounded very casual. How's the kid? We just left him, two bits said. And I could tell he was deliberating whether to tell Dally the truth or not. I don't know about the stuff like this, but, well, he seemed pretty bad to me. He passed out cold when we left him. Dally's jawline went white as he swore between clenched teeth. Two-Bit, you still got that fancy black-handled switch? Yeah, give it here. Two-Bit reached in his back pocket for his prized possession. It was a jet-handled switchblade, ten inches long, that would flash open at a mere breath. It was a reward of two hours of working aimlessly around a hardware store to divert suspicion. He kept it razor sharp. As far as I knew, he never pulled on anyone. He'd used a plain pocket knife when he needed a blade. But it wasn't his showpiece, his pride and joy. Every, one every time he ran into a new hood, he pulled it out and showed it off with it. Dally knew how much that knife meant to Two-Bit. And if he needed a blade and bad enough to ask for it, well, he needed a blade. There was all uh, there was all there was to it. Two-Bit handed over to Dally without a moment hesitation. we got to win that fight tonight, Dally said, his voice said with heart. we got to get even with the socks. 
for Johnny. He put the switchblade under his pillow and laid back, staring at the ceiling. We left. We knew better than to talk to Dally when his eyes were blazing and when he was in a mood like that. We decided to catch a, bu catch a bus home. I just didn't feel much like walking or trying to hitch a ride. Two-Bit left me sitting on the bench at the bus stop while he went to a gas station to buy some cigarettes. I was kind of sick to my stomach and sort of groggy. I was nearly asleep when I felt someone's hand on my forehead. I was almost jumped out of my skin. Two-Bit was looking down at me worriedly. You're feeling okay? You're awfully hot. I'm all right, I said. And when he looked at me as if he didn't believe it, I got a little panicky. Don't tell Derry, okay? Come on, Two-Bit. Be a buddy. I'll be well by tonight. I'll take a bunch of aspirin. All right, Two-Bit said reluctantly, but Derry will kill me if you're really sick and go ahead and fight anyway. I'm okay, I said, getting a little angrily. And if you, and if you keep your mouth shut, Derry won't know a thing. You won't know something, Two-Bit said as we were riding home on the bus. You think you could uh, you could get away with murder, living away with living with your big brother and all, but Derry's stricter, stricter with you than your folks were, ain't he? Yeah, I said, but we raised two boys. But they raised two boys before me. Derry hasn't. You know, the only thing that keeps Derry from being from being a sock is us. <sighs> I know, I said. I had known for a long time, in spite of not having much money, the only reason Derry couldn't be a sock was us, the gang, me and Soda. Derry was too smart to be a greaser. I did, don't know how I knew it. I just did. I was kind of sorry. I was silent most of the way home. I was thinking about the rumble. I had a sick feeling in my stomach, and it wasn't from being ill. It was from the same kind of helplessness I had felt the night Derry yelled at me for going to sleep in the lot. I had the same deathly fear that something was going to happen that none of us could stop. And we got off the bus, I finally said, Tonight, I don't like it one bit. Too bit pretending not to understand. I never knew you to play chicken in a rumble before. Not even when you were a little kid. I knew he was trying to make me mad, but I, I took the bait anyway. I ain't chicken, Too bit Matthews. You know it, I said angrily. Ain't I a Curtis, same as Soda and Dairy? Too bit couldn't deny this, so I went on. I mean... I got awful feeling something's going to happen. Something is going to happen. We're going to stop the Sox guts, that's what. Two-Bit knew what I meant. He doggedly pretended not to. He seemed to feel that if something was all right, it immediately was, no matter what. He'd been that way all his life, and I didn't expect him to change. So the Pop wouldn't, would have understood, and he would have tried to figure it out. But Two-Bit ain't, just ain't Soda, not by a long shot. Cherry Valance was sitting in her Corvette by the vacant lot when we came by. Her long hair pinned up, and in the daylight, she looked even, she was even better looking. That Stingray was one tough car, bright red one. It was cool. Hi, Pony Boy, she said. Hi, Two-Bit. Two-Bit stopped. Apparently, Cherry had shown up there before during the week, and Johnny and I had spent in Winn-Dixville. Winn what's, up, what's up with the big times? She tightened the strings on her ski jacket. They, they, they play your way. No weapons. Fair deal. Your rules. You sure? She nodded. Rainy told me. He knows for sure. Two-bit turned and started home. Thanks, Cherry. Pony boy, stay a minute, Cherry said. I stopped and I went back to her car. Rainy's not going to show up at the rumble. Yeah, I said, I know. He's not scared. He's just sick of fighting. Bob. She swallowed and then went quietly. Bob was his best buddy since grade school. I thought of so then Steve. What if one of them saw the other killed? Would that make them stop fighting? No, I thought. Maybe it wouldn't make Soda stop, but not Steve. He'd go on hating and fighting. Maybe that was what Bob would have done if he had been Randy instead of him. How's Johnny? Not so good, I said. Will you go to, up to see him? She shook her head. No, I couldn't. Why not, I demanded. If it, was at le it was the least she could do. It was her boyfriend who caused it all, and then I stopped. Her boyfriend. I couldn't, she said in a quiet, desperate voice. He killed Bob. Oh, maybe Bob asked for it. I, I know he did. But I could ever look at, at the person who killed him. You, o he, you only knew his bad side. You could be, he could be sweet sometimes and friendly. But when he got drunk, it was, it was the part of him that beat up Johnny. I knew it was Bob when you told me this story. He was so proud of his rings. Why do people sell liquor to boys? Why? I know there's a law against it, but kids get it anyway. I can't go see Johnny. I know I'm too young to be in love and all that, but Bob was something special. He wasn't just a boy. He had something that made people follow him, something that marked him different, maybe a little better than the crowd. Do you know what I mean? I did. Cherry saw the same thing in Dallas. That's why she was afraid to see him, afraid of loving him. 
I knew what she meant. I knew what she meant, all right. But she also meant she wouldn't go see Johnny because he had killed Bob. That's okay, I said sharply. It wasn't Johnny's fault. Bob was a booze hound, and Sherry went for boys who were bound for trouble. I wouldn't want to see him. You're a traitor to your own kind and not loyal to us. Do you think your spying for us makes up for the fact that you're sitting there in the Corvette while my brother drops out of school to get a job? Don't you ever, don't you ever feel sorry for us? Don't you ever try to get us hangouts, um, handouts, and then feel high and mighty about it? I started to turn and walk off, but something in Cherry's face made me stop. I was ashamed. I couldn't stand to see girls cry. She was crying, but she was close to it. I wasn't trying to give you charity, Pony Boy. I only wanted to help. I liked you from the start, the way you talked. You're a nice kid, Pony Boy. Do you realize how nice, how scared nice kids are nowadays? Wouldn't you try and help me if you could? I would. I'd help her and Randy both if I could. Hey, I said suddenly, can you see the sunset real good from the west side? She blinked, startled, then smiled real good. You can see it good from the east side too, I said quietly. Thanks, Pony Boy. She smiled through her tears. You dig okay? She had green eyes. I went on, walking home slowly. All right, so again, please answer the following three questions in a Google Doc. Number one, Pony Boy and Cherry have an argument but when they say goodbye, they are on good terms. What causes the change in mood? Number two, what internal conflict could Johnny be having? And number three, if Derry didn't have soda and Pony Boy, why would he be a sock? Join me next week, sixth graders. We'll be delving into chapters nine and ten of The Outsiders. Keep reading, sixth graders.